All right, so the shootouts you were engaged in weren't during wartime service, and some of the people in the comments have said that you are a psychopath. How do you respond to that? Well, have you looked at the psychopathic checklist? Yeah. By Dr. Hare? I've read a few books, but I've not looked at Dr. Well, Hare's, I don't the, think. The actual... Um, I've read John Ronson's The Psychopath Test. Well, Dr. Hare is the guy who came up with what's called the psychopathic checklist. Okay. And he actually uh, he comes from the same area I came from. About really? The same time too. Here's a copy of it. You can just kind of look at it. He carries the psychopath checklist around with him, folks. Well, I thought you'd be interested. <laughs> I thought you'd be interested. <laughs> Okay, so number one, glibness, superficial charm. I think you've got a genuine charm. Well, when you look at glibness and superficial charm, doesn't it depend whether you like it or not? If you don't like what the guy's saying, some salesman trying to sell you air conditioners or something, then he's glib and superficial. Yeah. But if you like it and you agree with what he's saying, he's with, you know, what? climate extinction or you know the greenpeace and you agree with that then he's he's not superficial you know he's right on he's 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 so it's very subjective well yeah they those people are phony aren't they you definitely keep it real previous diagnosis as psychopath well that's a nice circularity isn't it right? <laughs> <laughs> If you've been diagnosed as a psychopath, you probably, maybe, <laughs> this time around, are a psychopath. <laughs> I mean, that fills out the checklist nicely, that one. <laughs> Did they do any tests on you? No. Okay. Egocentricity, grandiose sense of self-worth. You speak in a very low-key, self-dep way with your humor, so you don't come across as grandiose. Well, there's an interesting it's like thing a, about... There's like a deadly energy to you, but you're mild-mannered as well. Well, there's an interesting thing about sort of grandiosity. When they ask, when they survey drivers, they ask driver, do you think you're better than average driver or worse than average or average? 80% of people say they're better than average. Okay. The same thing when they, when they ask people about intelligence. When they ask people, how intelligent do you rate yourself? 80% of people rate themselves above average. So, again, I'm not really sure. Yeah. I, I have a feeling that most people, to have confidence in life, you have to see your life in kind of rose-tinted glasses to a certain extent. If you wander around thinking, shit, I'm going to die. Nothing means anything. The worms are going to eat me. Then you're going to just, what, crawl into the bottle or stay in bed? Cause a premature heart attack and never achieve anything. I think if you want to achieve things especially, you've got to be goal-focused and confident in your ability. You certainly have got to have self-confidence, or then you're never even going to start or attract anyone to your cause. Proneness to boredom, low frustration tolerance. Oh, I'd probably have to plead guilty on that one, right? <laughs> <laughs> Pathological lying and deception. Well, the, what's, what's normal lying and what's pathological? Help me, guys. <laughs> normal what? lying versus pathological. <laughs> what's the difference? Pathological would mean what? That you always lie? Does it mean you're lying all the time and you believe your lies? Well, I don't know if that, it doesn't really say it, but if you're pathological, that means what, you're, you're, you're lying more than most normal people do? So, I mean, my children would tell me lies, right? I'd say, well, were you eating the cookies? And they'd say, no. And I'd see the cookie crumbs in her mouth, right? And I'd say, no. And then I told my parents lies. So there's white lies. And, and then there's the relationship lies. Well, where were you last night? Oh, well, I was at work. Oh, yeah, okay, well. And it, the social grease, lying is almost part of the social grease to make things smooth. So then you got to ask yourself, what's pathological lying? So I'm still stymied on that one. Conning slash lack of sincerity. 
it's going to be your whether you think I'm conning you or I think you're conning me. It's going to be subjective judgment, isn't it? Yeah. Lack of remorse or guilt for your crimes. Well, I feel guilty about my brother being killed. I that's the big stain on my life. You yeah. Know, right, right from that time on. About robbing drug dealers, Psh, I used to enjoy it. I don't feel guilty about that at all. I mean, I, it's like, do you ever watch The Wire? I've watched a few. When they talk about the game, if you're in the game, mm. then that's the game. Well, that's what people told me as well. Um, it's like two Tonys who was a hitman, he, he said, it's like, you know, you sign up for the military, kill or be killed. You sign up for gangland, drug wars and mafias, kill or be killed. So, lack of affect and emotional depth. Lack of affect and emotional depth. What, what, what would be an example of that? Lack of affect, guys? What does that mean? Affect. So, for example... Lack of emotional depth, say. Well, for example, some people get the news. I got the news my grandmother died while I was in jail in Yolo County. Now, I didn't show any emotion when they told me, but about three hours later when I was in the bed, a blanket over my head, I was in tears. Now, if you saw me when I got told that and I didn't have any reaction to it, what, do I get told that I'm, I have no lack of effect and lack of emotional depth? Well, you just can't show weakness in there, can you? So, how do you judge this kind of thing? What? Who's to say how different people react to different situations? You know, Italians burst into tears at almost nothing. I remember Joe Biazzi, this heroin dealer. He was going to, uh, upstairs in Canada, he was going to uh, court to get his sentence. And his lawyer told him he was looking at 20 years for heroin. And he was in front of the mirror in tears, just pouring down his face. Me bambini, me bambini. But I said to him, Joe, I said, you weren't crying when you were selling all that heroin. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I guess it all depends when you catch a person, whether you see that. So he was, he's ticked on acting skills. Mitigating circumstances at court hearings. Okay, so callous lack of empathy. So what is empathy? Empathy is f understanding or feeling what the other person is feeling. Yeah. Well, you have to have empathy if you're going to deal with people. The, there, are, there are people who have no empathy, but they're not psychopaths. They're autistic. Have you ever been around autistic people? Yeah, autistic children, for example, have absolutely no, well, certain kinds of autistic children. Their mother is nothing in particular. They're just She's just a vehicle to get the orange juice they want out of the fridge. They're, the human t contact means nothing. They don't want to be touched. They care about patterns and numbers and music. They have no, no interest at all. I visited uh, an autistic couple with my daughter once. I mean, excuse me, the, a couple had two autistic children. And they were so happy because my daughter was about 10, but similar to the age of these autistic kids. And so my daughter went out to play with them. And she came running into the, uh, into the kitchen. She said, Daddy, Daddy. She said, that boy's killing his brother. So oh, we rushed out. And sure enough, the older autistic boy was literally strangling his brother because his brother wouldn't get off the trampoline fast enough. And he was trying to kill him. And he had no empathy with the fact that he was his brother or not. So yes, there are people like that, but they're autistic. So I'm, again, you never hear this when people talk about autistic kids, but yeah. Parasitic lifestyle. What, pimps? People like that? How about drug dealers? You were a tax man, weren't you? So you, <laughs> you taxed the parasites. Yeah. Short-tempered, poor behavioral controls. Well, I would, I would say I'm the opposite to that. Uh, 
poor behavioral controls get you in a lot of trouble fast. You're a chess player. Mm. Promiscuous sexual relations. Well, when I was a teenager, we all wanted pr promiscuous sexual relations. I mean, that was what the goal was, right? <laughs> 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 Any girl that, uh, yeah, anyway. Early behavioral problems. Does that mean drinking when you're a teenager? Does that mean what? I imagine like getting arrested early, um, harming animals, Setting things fires, like that. Yeah. Unusual. No, I'm afraid we didn't know arson when I was young. Lack of realistic long-term plans. Well, here's a long-term plan. Um, about 29 years ago, I planted a forest, 40 hectares of pine trees. And last year I harvested it. $1.5 million. Wow. That was 28 years I waited for that investment to come true. Good grief. I mean, now that, you'd be hard pressed to find a better example of long term planning than that one. Impulsivity. Hmm. <laughs> I'm a bit impulsive, I have to, I have to admit that. Irresponsible behavior as parent. Well, I have the number of daughters, and one of them's got an MA in genetics. My second daughter is studying university in French. My third daughter has uh, just finished her training in the British Army. None of them have had juvenile delinquency cases or any kind of... Uh, and do, do they know your history? I don't know. I mean, everybody has broadband these days, right? <laughs> I mean, would you would you Google your own family? Yeah. Yes. How about you guys? You Google your own family, brother, sister, friends. Yes, everybody Googles everybody now. So, I don't know about that one, but I suspect. Put it that way. If I mean, I was okay basically. My story was hidden in the, in the dust of time until broadband happened. Do you remember how internet used to be? It was a dial-up thing, Prodigy. Dial-up and one page would take a couple of minutes to flip on and you didn't want to waste your time, right? You just stayed with the important things. You weren't just Googling the neighbors for fun. But now with instant broadband, everybody's on everybody. Especially with high-speed Virgin. Frequent marital relationships. Well, in, in San Quentin, you could, you could get married tomorrow and then have a private family visit in three months. Because Tex Watson did that, didn't he? Yeah. Didn't he have kids? Yeah. If people haven't, are not aware of who he is, he was a henchman for Charles Manson. Yeah, Charlie Manson. So the system was if you weren't married, you couldn't have a private family visit. Private family visit was two or three days in the trailer with a woman. Now, you know. So, I had uh, I had one of those, but I never actually got to the f the private family visit. But I did have a, a marriage in prison just for that purpose, because you know. Yeah, it's um, it's something that you really uh, <laughs> drives you crazy. Juvenile delinquency. Well, I got a little bit of juvenile delinquency. I got done for theft when I was 15, a little bit of foolishness, yeah. What did you steal? Uh, some money, you know, in a store. A woman put her money down on the counter and I grabbed it and ran off. Poor probation or parole risk? Well, that's one of those circular ones because what happens in prison is they almost everybody is considered a poor risk. And then if they say you're not a risk and you do something, it's going to come back on the parole officer or on the parole board. So they always err towards safety. Well, come back in a couple of years, you know, Mr. Atwood. So actually, I was a pretty good risk. I got out in 1987 and haven't been back. What's that, 30 years with no contact? Yeah. 
Failure to accept responsibility for own actions. <clears throat> do the crime, do the time. And you did your time. Many, but escaped. <laughs> many, <laughs> many types of offence. Well, I suppose. I, well, no, not really. They're, they're pretty, pretty much of a muchness, aren't they? Drug or alcohol abuse, not direct cause of antisocial behavior. Now, you see, that question there is a dangerous one. Because basically what you're doing is, it's a code way of saying, if you don't cop to some drug or substance abuse, we're going to write you up as a psychopath. So nobody wants to be written up as a psychopath. And so I'll give you an example. There was a guy, a guy named Strepnik. He was a, he was a rounder in Vancouver, a professional criminal. And he was a violent guy. So he knifed a guy in the neck in a bar um, and beat it because the guy didn't see him do it. And about six months later, he did the same thing to another guy, except the guy's friend glassed him and just cut him right, face right open like this, just. Anyway, the problem for him was that they knew he'd done the first one, but he hadn't been made for it. And so they were, they're setting him up for the psychopath role, which would mean, what's the, what do they call it in England, uh, where you get an endless sentence that you never... IPP, indeterminate. There we go. And so in Canada, they had something similar to that, and he was desperate not to get. So he sat down with five of us, and we brainstormed how we could go to the parole board. You know, have you got any child abuse in your, in your, in your childhood? You know, have you got any, was your dad touching you? Was your uncle or a scoutmaster, anything, a priest? And he, he said, no, I didn't have any of that. Well, have you got any drug convictions? Anything. Oh, he said, once when I was 18, I got stopped for a couple of caps of heroin. Oh, I said, that's perfect. You're, you're a drug addict. Now, the fact is, he wasn't, he used drugs, but he wasn't an addict. But we had to create a package for him so that he could memorize it and go to the parole board, shed a few tears to get out. Because the problem is, They've set up this, psych this uh, psychopath stuff so easily that violent offenders in prison are almost automatically shunted in that direction unless they can somehow s slip out of it. Now, fortunately, he, he managed to tell the tale with some enthusiasm and uh, got you know some parole with drug program and counseling and da-da-da-da.